Thank you for your patience. Good evening. Welcome to the graveyard slot. Apologies, you've got me again. Um, actually, it's worse than that um, because this is also the first time in five years I've spoken to a live audience of anything like this size. But Jeffrey stole all of my jokes about that yesterday. So if you'll excuse me one, um, the thing that I'm finding a little bit different is that a, everyone's in 3D, but uh, you're also not all black screens. Um, so if you don't want me to remember the funny expressions you make when I say something provocative, then, then turn your camera off. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Gabrieli, Gabrielino Tongva people as the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting um, and acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people as the traditional custodians of the lands on which I work um, and live. Um, traditionally, I make an observation about how when we think about the transmission of knowledge stably through time, that we have a lot to learn um, from Indigenous cultures, and particularly in the Australian context where we have real hard physical evidence of the cultural transmission of knowledge, practice, training, um, and agriculture through tens of thousands of years, which makes our conversations about preservation seem a little bit basic sometimes. Um, but actually, in the context of this conference, I think I want to observe the tremendous um, resilience and agility of Indigenous knowledge systems in trying to engage with Western knowledge systems. And we've heard from the, the talk we just heard, um, if you're in this room, uh, about systems that can embed an assumption of engaging with Indigenous knowledge um, through the uh, references to cultural contexts in many of the, the, the sessions we've heard throughout the, the conference. So I think that notion of forward looking um, and how uh, systems that are built on consensus um, and community building may be also things that we can look at going forward. Um, so John pinged me on Slack and said, are you coming to Force 11? And I said, look, I'd really like to. He said, no, you have to come. I've persuaded Jeffrey and Jennifer. Um, can you talk about the Barcelona Declaration? And I said, uh, well, I can. Oh, he said, oh, 50 minutes. I thought, oh, my God. I haven't spoken for that long for a long time. And in some ways, the Barcelona Declaration is a bit dull. And I will get there, I promise, because it isn't that dull. And I know some people are interested in it. Um, but I thought it might be more interesting to ask the question of how the Barcelona Declaration fits in a trajectory of these manifestos and principles and declarations over time. Um, I particularly thought that was interesting. I turned 50 last year. So you start to reflect a bit on whether you've actually achieved anything. Sorry for the younger people in the room. Um, that just becomes part of your life as you get older, particularly in this space. Um, so to a very large extent, if I'm known for anything, it's a set of documents, declarations, um, I started blogging at a time where that was almost enough in and of itself for people to pay attention to you. Um, at a time when social media was being invented and we were discovering new ways of, of coming across people and, and having conversations. Friend feed? Anyone? <laughs> it was a long time ago. Um, and so what are the questions you ask yourself? Okay, so I've been involved in saying things, talking about things. Um, has that achieved anything? Has that made any actual change versus, versus actual actions? So on the action side, sorry, Mentimeter again. Now let's see if I can get this to work. Do I have the technical skills of a six-year-old? So I put up a set of 
Can I go back? I can, I think. Oh, yep. But I can't move out of the way or Marty will shout at me. <laughs> Are we done? We got there? No? Did it work? I should have checked whether it was going to work or not. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> Technology, you know. All right, so when you get there, I think, in theory, you should find a list of things. Now, I didn't write all of these, um, but it's a mix of some of my research work. Oh, my God, there are a bunch of... Oh, no, no, they're not. Sorry, wrong, wrong bar. Um, some of what I think of as my most important research outputs, a bunch of documents, some of which I was involved in, I was involved in writing, some of which I was not. Um, and one or two pieces and a tool, I guess, a tool that, that we've built. Um, now, I guess it would be a bit sad if at this point of the conference you hadn't heard of the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. We might have been harping along on this a bit. So what we've got here, um, no, we do have an old school genome sequencing geek in the room. Hey. <laughs> So the Budapest Open Access Initiative, um, early 2000s, you know, seminal definition of um, of open access written by written by Peter Suba. A two people. Who's the second? Come on, out yourself. Sorry. So actually, I'm, I'm kind of surprised there are 12 people who remember what the patent principles are, um, but I'll talk about them in a bit. The Altmetrics Manifesto is somewhat better known. Posey we talked about, this paper's was very popular and in some ways is quite funny. Um, funny story, the um, it most significant number of its citations um, came from it being slash dotted because of the preprint where we had an acknowledgement section at the top where we made a whole series of jokes about the author order. But when it was published in Palgrove Communications, they put that down at the bottom and no one ever gets that far. Which is, to be fair, a, a lot of issues with my jokes is that they're not worth the wait. But anyway, Dora, Leiden Manifesto, I mean, things that are quite current and have been mentioned a few times in this in this conference. Um, Kirk OA dashboard, I'll show you this in a second. It's a, it's a tool we've built, we're quite proud of it. Um, this is a recent paper. Um, where I modestly say we actually showed that open access works, reaches more people. Um, that felt like a kind of important thing to do because we kind of showed it was more visible. We'd shown that it got more highly cited, uh, shown in some contexts um, that it had broader forms of impact of different types, but we hadn't actually shown that it reached more people. And particularly we hadn't shown, I don't think, that have reached more people outside of those areas where uh, wealthy institutions had access to subscription literature. And the Barcelona Declaration, well, okay, so, yep, I know it's got a European city name on it, um, but at least it's, it's made it's made it this far. Um, okay, I'm still, still amused that two people know the, um, know the genome paper. All right, moving on to the next one. Oh, everyone's already done it. Okay. I'll give you I'll give you a moment. It's always fun to watch these change as well. Oh, so this, so that's interesting. I've told just this is these are just the the statements and principles, obviously. It actually looks reasonably even, I think, in terms of how that's playing out. Or is it always interesting to see Dora and the Leiden Manifesto fight it out as well? But not surprising. I mean, the BOAI is really, you know, a kind of foundation document that's really stood the, the test of time. I don't want to come back to this, but a lot of that um, relates to the, I mean, the sheer beauty of Peter Suda's writing. Um, 
but you know there are there are there are many of us who can do a pretty good job of, of, of reciting at least the first couple of lines from memory um so then what i thought might be interesting was a distinction between which is the the most important and which has been the most successful oh but they're actually fairly similar And fairly tightly related to whether you've heard of them or not, I, I would guess. You probably don't think something's successful if you haven't heard of it. Whereas this is kind of interesting, because I think in a sense, I guess it depends on what you mean by successful, which was kind of the point of, of the exercise. The, the Budapest Open Access Initiative isn't the thing that made the change in open access, even though some of the same people were involved, there was a huge amount of work that followed on. And it was really only, at least as we calculated it in our work, 2018 was the first year in which the majority of globally published material was, was open access. Um, so a good 15 years, and I know, you know, not a few people in this room and many people in the community rail against the fact that it took more than about six months because, you know, obvious, right? Um, yeah, things turned out to be a little bit harder than that. Um, but it does raise the question of, of what makes the difference? The, the words, do the words set up the space for the action? Um, or is it the action that's important? And sometimes and people take different roles in these processes, and I'll come back to this, in fact, probably the central message I want to leave you with, that activist communities are people taking different parts of these processes on that matters in the long term. All right, I'll stop bothering you with quizzes. I'll get back to barraging you with slides. So for those of you who are wondering, uh, this paper which we published in 2005, this was the first paper that I was corresponding author um, that was desk rejected by nature. Um, my primary achievement in my research career is that every single paper I've ever submitted to nature was desk rejected. Um, every single one of them, except the most recent, has over 100 citations. So I just feel that's, I'm just ahead of my time, right? Um, uh, this is a paper I'm very proud of. I, in many ways, this, is, this, this paper is probably the most impactful piece of research work um, I did in the sense that at the time, um, there were a couple of companies fighting it out to try and um, develop a method of sequencing that would get the cost of sequencing a human genome down to under $100. And um, this was in the context of the Human Genome Project having its hitting its first major milestones, not being finished, but in a few years earlier, and that had cost obviously a few billion dollars. Um, and we actually had a project uh, to develop another method of sequencing that turned out to be a complete failure. Um, but as part of that, we were trying to develop computational infrastructure to be able to put the sequences back together. And everyone had been saying, well, the human genome is whatever it is, 4.2 billion base pairs long, statistically speaking. A 16 base pair sequence should be unique in the human genome. And it occurred to us to maybe ask the question, the human genome is not a random sequence. Maybe 16 base pairs isn't unique. Um, and that turned out to be the case. Um, for those of you who are computational scientists sort of get geeky about this, um, we solved this problem, which was a big problem, right? Text search across 4.2 billion token string. Uh, looking for repetitive sequences, we built a suffix uh, suffix tree um, to solve that problem. Um, and again, for those of you historical context, um, it, we couldn't finish the project um, until we found a uh, a way of doing this that allowed us to write suffix tree and read it from disk. Um, suffix trees were all memory based algorithms, and the problem was we figured out we'd need to build a computer that had 64 gigabytes of RAM to be able to do this in memory. And that was gonna cost us 60,000 um, pounds. 
in reality, I didn't do most of this work. I, I noticed there was a story to tell about why this was interesting. Um, and, and we told that story and, um, and it was pretty successful. Um, this is the sort of the main public output of the work, the group um, that I co-lead at the moment, the Curtain Open Knowledge Initiative. Um, and it's a product, it's a tool, it's a service. Um, you can go and find it online. That link should work. Um, and I wanted to show this for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that um, when you go to that tool and you use it, you'll find it really responsive. You know, websites used to be simple and responsive and you didn't have to wait five minutes for them to load. Um, and the designer, the, the web architect we got to do this, um, who's the person who also proposed the project, um, had the brief that it had to load in under 10 seconds in Africa or indeed suburban Australian cities where the internet is actually worse in many cases. And we also got a designer. Um, so I think we've had four or five talks talking about, oh, what is this green open access? What is this gold open access? I don't understand. I don't know what's going on. So we just changed it. Um, and we invented blue open access. Um, but we didn't call it that. So it's it's stuff stuff where it's accessible at the publisher website, stuff where it's accessible somewhere else, stuff where it's accessible in both places. Reasonably straightforward. Um, and we'll see whether that gets any adoption. I keep trying to use it. So again, um, those of you who remember a piece I wrote, again, uh, what was it, about 10 years ago, um, trying to persuade people through writing to get away from these colors and talk about things in much more concrete terms. Um, that was a total failure. <laughs> this seems like it might be working. Um, this is being adopted in, in many places and being used by, by many groups. So. So it seems like doing, the, in this case, doing the thing, just not having an endless conversation about it, not arguing about whether we include the licensing or not, um, not arguing about the details of whether we include bronze this or what bronze means on a good day with the following wind when you're wearing the right socks. Um, and just doing it and making something that was useful and people used um, was the way to, to make that change. Um, the other reason, oops, oh, you don't you dare. Literally, Apple security update. So I still have one postponement, and I don't have to do any of that. Um, the other reason I wanted to show is we don't have any actual funding to um, this site. So soft launch, um, if you find this useful, um, or valuable, I should say, um, and you are able to. We've actually um, now set up, I just imagine me doing the Jimmy Wales, please give us money thing, because I'm not very good at it. Um, but um, it would be greatly appreciated um, if people do think this is valuable um, and think it's it's valuable enough. Um, we've, tr we live inside a university so the hypocrisy of me yesterday saying, oh, no, everyone should have a surplus, everyone should have proper governance, everyone should do these things and have a contingency fund. Um, those are all things that are actually impossible for us to do in our current system. So one of the things that helps us make the argument for being allowed to set up the systems to do this is if we can show that people care enough about the stuff that we've built, they really do want it to survive. Um, but anyway, sorry, enough, enough, enough begging. Um, and next time we'll hire Jimmy Wales because he does a lot better. So let me talk through these these five sets of of documents and, and things I've been writing. So the one that people have a few people remember um, it was a long time ago. Um, the the patent principles. So these these started um, as a conversation in in July two thousand and nine. Um, ended up being published um, 
or released in July, in February 2010. So one of the things I keep pointing out is this, that there tends to be a bit of a time delay in, in many of these things. Patent principles was about research data. Um, and in particular, although it sort of presented itself as a set of guidelines for researchers um, to uh, be persuaded that licensing data might be a good thing, uh, and this was 20, 2009, 2010, this was a difficult conversation to have, it was also a compromise between two quite strained positions about licensing um, of data, and in particular the view of those people who came from a strong sense of the GPL side, the free software side of the free and open source community, that share alike would be fine, um, that, that these viral licenses for data would be okay. And those of us, and I was on the other side, who could see this turning into an utter nightmare when we were trying to integrate these big data sets, which at the time we imagined we didn't have. Um, and, um, and that we were gonna have this problem of, you know, a data set that had a viral license on one side and had, I don't know, human subjects information on the other and being told, well, no, you can't combine these two data sets because if you put the two together, you have to share them under the same license. And that was just not going to be acceptable. And there's so many ways in which the intricacies of this just, just essentially stop you doing things. And the irony is, 20 years later, this doesn't matter to most people because they just use the data and get on with the job. And the five or 10 of us who actually do these large scale data integrations with the intent of making the results public are still facing the same problems that everyone told us weren't gonna be an issue. Um, now, in the meantime, various things happened like Creative Commons uh, sorted out the Creative Commons attribution license. So it was much more appropriate for data. Um, believe it or not, I'm not gonna give a lecture on licensing. I've grown up, I'm moving on. Um, no, just don't get me started. It's probably better that way. Um, but at the time, this was actually quite a radical thing, but it, it only really reached a fairly niche community. But it, it was used in various places as a way to sort of support the argument that this was a good way of moving forward as these things moved into to implementation. Um, I'm going to call out one thing, which again, as this will this will be a bit of a theme for the next couple of declarations. What is wrong with this picture? <laughs> the light wasn't great. You've been in the pant and arms, Alex. <laughs> Carpet's not great either. Yep. <laughs> the women are not credited. Uh, uh, neither is Chris, um, but he's a lawyer, so he doesn't count. Um, so this is Jenny Malloy and this is Carolina Rossini. Jenny Malloy is now a professor at Cambridge. Um, Caroline is still married to John, um, but she's also the, I can't even remember. She's, she's been through, she's been in a series of very high profile jobs. If you're actually working government data, particularly sensitive government data and, and policy areas, um, you will have seen her work um, repeatedly over the last couple of years but yeah they, they were there and and the, and the focus of this conversation was an argument between myself John and and John Wilbanks and Rufus Pollock but these were not people who were not involved in in drafting the document and for whatever reason um I'm just you know embarrassed that they were never listed as authors never never credited um and um yes and we ended up with the first I guess it, I guess if you call it a manifesto, then it was a mantle, um, in that sense, or a yeah, a manifesto. Um, and maybe that says something about it. Um, did it succeed? Well, the the and this is again a theme. Spark, um, Spark North America. You know, Heather Joseph is a force of nature. Um, pulled on this and used it as part of her advocacy work in policy work towards open data mandates and open data systems in 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 the U.S. in particular. Like I say, it got picked up in various places, but I was struck when I went and looked at that Spark piece. Um, imagine a world in which every article and every data set can be seamlessly stored, linked, and navigated through. Yeah, imagine. 
it laid a lot of groundwork, but it did not change the world in and of itself. Um, number two, the Altmetrics Manifesto, um, also a manifesto. Um, really, this was mainly written by Jason Prem um, with um, Dario Taraborelli and, and Paul Groth um, refining it. And they, in fact, came to me relatively late um, in the process because they thought adding my name would somehow make it look make it look better. Um, does anyone remember what the Altmetrics Manifesto is actually about? Has anyone read it? Has anyone cited it? Right, at least I didn't get more hands. <laughs> so the Altmetrics Manifesto is routinely referred to or cited when people talk about altmetrics in general or social media metrics um and those kinds of things but um what a bunch of what, what what's actually the case is that this is the first paragraph it's actually about search and discovery it was about curation um rather than evaluation and it was about research on the impact of of research in many ways, if the, the call was for more research. Um, and so it's really interesting that it's now sort of um, seen as a document that's about um, indicators and, and evaluation and, um, and metrics. And these are now metrics through the work that you and did at altmetric.com that have become um, standardized and, and normalized in many ways, they're routinely used in my university um, as part of um, regular cases. So in some senses, I guess, there was a real sense in which that was, was adopted. But at the same time, we haven't really achieved this vision, certainly not the vision that we thought was possible through, through the idea that the, the visibility and usability and use and conversation around research was going to be a strong driver. Um, now, right, again, other naive things. Both the, the patent principles and the Altmetrics Manifesto are fundamentally techno-utopian. Um, they assume the technology is going to be good. They assume it's going to be great. I mean, we're talking about social media here. Um, and again, yeah, this is, this is 2010. So I think we can be slightly forgiven um, for thinking social media was a positive. It kind of was at the time. I mean, there were still awful things going on, but it it certainly was a lot better than it became. Um, and as it's now fragmented, um, it's hard to know. So yes, again, influential, um, important in terms of the way it's set an agenda moving and, and, and other people doing the work to, in the end, instantiate that and and bring us to where we've we've now come. Um, but the original concept, the original vision, I think not not so much. And again, this will be a this will be a theme um, as it comes through. I think the other sort of ironic point is that it's most my most highly cited piece of work, which is funny for two reasons. One is the fact that it's the most highly cited when it's about not using citations anymore because they're not that helpful. Um, and the other is that it's a blog post. Um, and I'll come back to that point later. Okay, the Force 11 Manifesto. Now, I think I'm the only person in the room who was at the Dagstall meeting. Am I right? I'm right about that. And there are two or three of us who are at the first Beyond the PDF meeting in San Diego. Four, yep, okay. Um, so I'll probably get away with saying a few things. Um, so, I mean, this is the origin story of Force 11. Phil Vaughan organized a meeting seeking to talk about, you know, blowing up the PDF and, and moving on to new things. Um, you know, scholarly communication obviously was gonna be entirely different. Everything was gonna change. And this was at a point, I think, where um, if, you, if you think back, if you can remember that far back, you, scholarly literature on the web still looked like the web looked like in 1997. It was before it, it felt like anyone had actually brought a designer in. Um, I think we got sort of curved bezels 
on journal pages, um, you know, around 2012, 2013, something like that. I'm over-egging it, but but it was still a, it was still quite an ugly experience. And the PDFs were designed and typeset and 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 beautiful in a sense. And they were certainly popular. This was this was a time when it was demonstrably the case that there were more people downloading PDFs than there were actually reading the articles as HTML. That's that flipped some time later. Um, and that simply collided with a meeting that Anita Devard and Ed Hovey and, and Ivan Hertman had planned to organise in Darkstall, which was about a lot of the same things. Um, and so they brought this sort of two sets of communities together um, that came from different perspectives, included publishers, librarians, technologists, researchers, um, and, and met and drafted this document. And I needed to sort of show it was a long document. This is the abstract. Um, and I think the thing that struck me going back to this is the point of this wasn't really the document. The point of this was the process of writing it um, and the community that came out of it. And, and so in that sense, the is the document a success? Yes, the, the writing of the document was a success. It led to many things. Um, it led to a community, it led to a conference, it led to a set of people being here at the first conference, first force conference they've come to, and a few people <laughs> who've been here for, for many of them. Um, and it's the possibilities of that community. Um, I wrote a piece around the Force 11 story, which I called the social infrastructure, because I think it's not about the outcomes, so much as it is about the possibility of having a platform in which people can come together and build outcomes. Um, and the distinctive aspect of, of Force 11, in my view, um, is that international aspect of it, but also the cross community aspect of it, that we still have librarians and technologists and researchers and publishers, and even a few vendors. Okay, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the principles of the scholarly infrastructure. You're probably bored with them by now. Um, and in fact, I'll come back to the observation, but this, this is actually a screenshot from my blog site, which is still up, kind of, um, and is actually the first of these declarations that's on its original URL. Come back to that point. And so I come to the Barcelona Declaration, and the Barcelona Declaration is different for a number of reasons. So I wasn't really involved in writing a document like this between 2015 and last year. Um, and the story of the Barcelona Declaration is an interesting one, but it's also one that's in a different world. I don't know whether many of these things would even work today. The, the, the scope of the social web was smaller. You didn't need to shout as much to get any attention. The algorithms kind of didn't exist. You actually got feeds of all the content without it being filtered by some arbitrary machine that decided once you'd bought one toilet seat, you clearly were gonna buy another toilet seat every week for the next seven years or something. Um, you watch one YouTube video on the use of lighting for epoxy projects in the workshop where you're building the furniture, and that's what you're going to have to watch that precise subset of, of, of all YouTube videos for the, for the rest of your life. Um, now, if, if we could do that in the scholarly literature, I'd actually appreciate it. Um, but, yeah, not so impressed on the... So, so the Barcelona Declaration. So the first point I want to make is I'm switching the slide template. That's significant. I'll come back to it. That's the website. Feel free to go and visit. Um, if you want to know where the, the GitHub page is already is on GitHub, not GitLab. Um, I can explain that later. Um, and if you want to criticize our CSS, you can. Um, but I'd rather you just fixed it. 
Um, so what is the Barcelona Declaration? I, was, I said I would spend some time talking about what it is. So the Barcelona Declaration is about open research information, the, 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 the information about the research process and the assertion that, that we collectively made that this should be open, indeed must be open if we're going to achieve this kind of goals that we've set for ourselves. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, we are basing much of our assessment of researchers and research institutions on untransparent evidence, but if you want to be fair in those assessments, you, you need full transparency. Um, we're making decisions that are based, and you've seen this, that the, we, can, we spend more time arguing about whether it would be better to use Scopus or some other database to represent the disparity in the amount of content we're not seeing from Africa than we do trying to figure out how to make the content from Africa more visible. Um, so we need inclusive data um, to make those kinds of assessment decisions. And then this is, and this is a line that many of us have been using for a while. It makes no sense to talk about evaluating a transition to open science using closed information and closed data. And so we're talking about this shift from, from closed research information um, to open research information. And this is really um, uh, an effort that's, that's really uh, Ludo Voltman's at CWTS. Um, and it didn't start with a declaration. It started with the idea of bringing together a coalition to try and make change. And the reason for making, wanting to make that change is sort of illustrated with this example. So this is a graph of um, publishers, and the number of journal articles that they have in the Crossref metadata system, and the number of those metadata entries that have an explicit affiliation in them. And you can see there's a kind of weirdly bimodal distribution going on here. There are a bunch of publishers up here um, doing a really fabulous job, and you're, you're usually very close to 100%, and usually the reason why it's not 100% is because there are older articles where there wasn't so much, much effort put in. Um, and these are not in, in this community necessarily the kind of publishers that we're always very happy with. So Hindawi have always had fabulous metadata. Um, but Wiley and Taylor and Francis and RSC are not, 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 not publishers that you would necessarily expect, I think, someone like me to be saying they're doing a really great job, right? But down at the other end, again, we have some, some disappointing cases. Okay, Elsevier, Spring and Nature, Boss. And I had to check this, and then I had remembered a story. So this is this is the PLOS participation, cross-ref participation report from yesterday. Mostly very good, but affiliations, persistent identifiers. And I don't pick on PLOS because Veronique's sitting there or um, um I pick on PLOS because I know from my experience working there that the people are passionate about doing these things well and doing them properly. In fact, this is a problem that dates from when I was there and John was there. And I think it's still the same problem, um, which is that the manuscript submission system that these large publishers use, which happens to be owned by Elsevier, doesn't provide that so, and this is a problem that could be fixed one way or another. Um, but in the, God, 10 years since I've left PLOS, it hasn't risen to the level of priority to change it. And so the question that, that, that Ludo said was, let's, if we're assuming good faith, how do we make this a priority? How do we shift this to, to be an important issue um, on the list of things we're doing? And the answer to that is you make it a requirement in your procurement decisions. And that is what the core of the Barcelona Declaration is about. The Barcelona Declaration was prepared by a group of 25 people we brought together from a range of institutions. One of the interesting things about this is that all of the institutions represented, the user institutions represented, none of them, none of those people had English as a first language. 
Uh, we met in Barcelona in 2023, and we published the declaration in, in 2024 at launch. This is the slides from the launch webinar. We had 50 signatories. We've now got about 100 um, a few months later. Um, I'll show you some of those signatories in a bit, but the first few signatories included the French government, the Sorbonne, the University of Milan, the University of Bologna, uh, the Gates Foundation, NWO, um, and others um, deliberately chosen to uh, make the point this was a serious group of organisations. So the Barcelona Declaration has four commitments. Um, the first is we will make openness the default. And this is intended to be read. It's interesting. Um, it's a strong statement, but we will make was always intended to be, this is a work in progress. I know there are, there are various people in the room who have said, yeah, this, the issue with this is we can't promise to do this tomorrow, so we can't sign. I say the intention was for it to be aspirational, but for not to be worded weekly. Um, but one of the really fascinating things about this was the fact that because we were drafting this with a largely non-English first language population, that the debate around the precise choice of words was fascinating. Um, this isn't the prettiest text I've ever been involved in writing. Um, but it was very carefully shaped. It's a kind of form of European English. And I wonder whether in part that's what makes it a little bit harder to read in North America. Um, because the use of language, the use of English in the European context is very particular. But anyway, that's a that's a, a that's another conversation about diversity. Now, the second, this second commitment is the core of it. Um, this is literally the money shot. Um, so that, and the reason I wanted to break it out is each of each of them have these two sub sub points. But so we will work with services and systems that support and enable open research information. What this is basically saying is, when we buy publishing services, we will require that metadata be open. So that you know, publishing agreements, transformational agreements. I could, I could stop wandering around and be the other yeah. option. Did you figure yeah, it out? Give, give me another spare one. That's, oh, that's okay. how long I'm going to be talking. No. Um, um, so publishing agreements, transformational agreements, consortial, local, national, whatever, build it in. Um, and then when we're making those agreements about the new sort of publishing models that, that, that PLOS is, we, we build that in as a requirement. Um, and part of the work will be to figure out model terms that can then be shared across, across institutions. And for this one, um, this is really focused on research information systems um, that you're able to get the data out. Now, in neither of these are we actually demanding open source or specific licensing. They're just saying the metadata needs to be made available when you're purchasing information services. And for internal systems, you need to be able to get the data out so it can be shared. Um, and again, for those of you who are in the, you know, in the market for a research information system, you will be aware of the difference between the ease of getting data out of something like Simplectic. I don't say it's easy, but at least it's possible, and something like Pure. So then the third and fourth declare, uh, commitments will we'll support, we will actually contribute to infrastructure. Costs. Yeah, there is a theme here, yes. Um, but we'll support the sustainability of infrastructures. We really wrestled with the we will financially support or financially contribute to. Um, and that was, that was certainly a point of tension and debate. Um, but we landed on support. Um, and we'll basically we will work together, and and those are the, the four commitments. But the intent the intent here is to build into a particular point of leverage which we hadn't really hit before: the institutional purchasing power, which is huge, right? We talk about funders as though they have a lot of money and a lot of leverage, but institutions are actually handling much larger sums of money 
on a regular basis. It's been frequently observed that the Harvard Endowment could just buy Elsevier 30 times over and barely hiccup. Um, the capital we have in this system, in the HE system, is enormous. And if we deploy it thoughtfully and, and, and carefully, and this is a small piece of the overall puzzle, um, then we can make change. Uh, when we launched, we had these infographics um, with statements from various important people chosen from to be as broadly and diversely geographical as we could amongst the signatories we had at the time. Were we successful in getting a huge diversity from a geographical perspective? No, but we we we, we let out. And the point I wanted to make about shifting this the, the slide template and the website and these is we brought in a designer. All of those previous declarations, the six months was wrangling the text and the six months was wrangling the text in this case as well. But actually a lot of the six months was building a comms plan, getting the initial signatories on board, making sure we had the media lined up and primed to interview those people. So for the first time, I'd actually really thought through how to get something communicated out. Um, if you are interested and organized, then drop us an email again. I'll come back to this. Um, yeah, domain name, a professional looking email. I get, I get, you know, you, those companies that still use a Gmail, um, send you an invoice. Um, or if you're uh, an organizing providing data services or infrastructure, then we have this category of supporter. Again, the whole set of questions here that I don't have time to go into the details of, but thinking through the different categories of support and separating out the purchases, the ones who are putting the money in um, from the others. So, so this is the website. Um, a couple of observations about the website. One is that color gradient makes a huge difference to how professional the website looks. Um, in actual fact, the website was put together primarily by Bianca Kramer and me. Uh, this was our first time fiddling around with CSS, but you can do that gradient in CSS. It's just fine. Um, Stack, this was before Stack Overflow went really bad, to be fair. So, um, But the other thing is we recycled. It's just the Prince of the Posey website rebadged. So I will draw this to a close. Um, I just wanted to make a few observations. Have I learned anything? I don't know. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. So, um, and I suspect we all are. Um, as I observed, we were talking about the future of research communication and we were getting snippy with a bunch of people telling us, oh, you haven't thought about archiving and you, you know, why are you arguing against PDFs when you're putting all this stuff on the web, it's all just gonna go and disappear. And we say, oh, that, that, that. technology's gonna be brilliant. It's all gonna be great. We're gonna... None of these. Well, the first three aren't on the original website. Um, they're mostly embedded in a set of broken links. Um, I found, well, one of them, uh, the old Matrix Manifesto is supposed to be redirecting to a Zenodo copy of the text of the manifesto, um, but it wasn't working when I checked. So I was gonna take that as a lose or a fail on our part, um, but I did find it on the Wayback Machine. Thank you, Internet Archive. Um, this might look okay, and I guess, but I think a couple of you have probably been looking at this thinking, oh my God, what is going on with the character encoding? And if anyone can tell me, it's a very old WordPress site. And if there's an easy way to fix the character encoding, please tell me. For whatever reason, Martin Fenner and his wonderful rogue scholar seems to have fixed it on the archived version that he's made. Um, but I do need to figure out that before I probably retire that and turn it into a static website. Um, so, the future of research communication turned out to be still involved in many of the things that its past was involved in. Preservation still matters. Steve Pettifer was right. The PDF has a place. Um, it's useful for various things. And in, 
the fact that many of these things still exist in a digital form at least is because there were PDFs made at the time in many cases. Um, in fact, the only record of the Beyond the PDF website that I was able to find was reconstructed from a PDF. Um, so I guess what the point I wanted to make, and this is echoing things that Danny has said and others have said, um, the communication strategy matters. And the reason, the reason for this fundamentally is it's hard to get taken seriously. Um, it's hard to get the attention of the people who matter and you're trying to reach. It's very easy to lose their attention and to be not taken seriously. So my old, my old joke, you get roughly 0.8 of a chance on average to convince an academic to do anything. Um, because you know, 20% won't bother in the first place and the other ones will only try once. Um, most of these things, we didn't think about that. Uh, we didn't think about communications and the reason that these things were successful in their time and did the things they did were in large part because we were in a different information environment. Um, professional, professionalism in communication matters. Um, and if you don't have that skill in the team you're bringing to do this kind of thing, then Bring that, bring that expertise and skill in. Um, but there are also many different ways and places to change. All of these manifestos and declarations hit different parts of the system in different ways with different levers. And in fact, they've acted together in some ways, in some ways synergistic, in some ways antagonistic. But they have interacted in ways that are really interesting. Um, find allies and build communities. And none of these were things I wrote on my own um, all of these were one things written by groups and they all benefited from that. And I think again, the Barcelona Declaration being written by people who didn't really speak English as a first language was a real exercise in, in trying to really build clarity in. And yeah, we didn't completely succeed, there's still issues. But choose the words carefully. Um, and then finally, I liked the way Danny was, was framing this at several points. Everything is interconnected. Um, and sometimes you're trying to make a change and nothing seems to be changing, but it doesn't mean that it isn't. Um, it doesn't mean that nothing's happening. Sometimes you just can't see that change yet. Um, and sometimes it's worth just trying to, to wait and see. Many of these things took five or 10 years to actually really have an effect. Um, yeah, if you don't try, obviously nothing's gonna change. So make the effort, but equally, um, don't try and change everything. I, you know, I've had more failures um, than successes, but uh, many of you will observe, well, that was because you couldn't keep your attention or anything for long enough to see it through, Dalen. Um, and well, there are no abrupt changes. There are only incremental um, steps, um, some of which when we tell the story about what happened, we always go back and find this abrupt change, the story of a big thing that happened, but we don't think about the time. So then my final point, it is my final point, John. This is all about storytelling. Words matter. Words are important. Words are a big part of it. This is the, the catch line we for ourselves at, at Koki to try and change the stories that universities tell about themselves. And so if you want to go down this path, this is the tool you want to use, then tell stories that people want to be a part of and, and want to make their own. Um, and I think that's what's special about Force 11.